Okay, so uh, we are going to do a discussion on semantic cognitive and perceptual computing. Um, putting it in the context of the previous panel, which was computing for human experience. So uh, this panel is about the uh, uh, computational system that has these two features: the semantic piece to it, uh, which uh, which defines how do you uh, ascribe meaning to the input subject, and then the cognitive piece to it, which is how do you uh, process that kind of meaningful information. And then the perceptual piece to it, which is uh, uh, how do you transform a raw uh, data level uh, perception inputs into things that the other two people can do. So, uh, and we want to do all of that uh, while addressing the human experience. So that's, that's sort of the theme of this. Research. So the panelists are uh, me, um, Vinendra, so then I uh, Lucian is uh, not able to join us today, but uh, uh, she was involved in this and Deepa. Uh, so, so then we will get us started. But before that, the outline is going to be that we're going to do a few slides for context. And then uh, we're going to go through some questions that uh, we came up with and discuss amongst the panelists. And finally, at the end, we will take our questions. Go ahead, all right, can you all hear me okay? Yep. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, awesome. Um, so recording in progress. All right, all right, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe that's we'll just do this. Um Okay, um, so human behavior involves the integration of um, information from different levels of abstraction. Um, so this includes um, perception, um, which is the process by which you um, uh, encounter things in the real world, and then the cognitive processes that um, transform um, those representations into your knowledge about the world. Um, reasoning, so this is the process where um, people um, and given certain information, can integrate that information at new conclusions, um, comprehension, and then communication. Um, so this is this uh, has influenced the development of integrated models in cognitive science. Um, so, for example, we have um, Neiser's model, um, which integrates um, locomotion and action, um, cognitive maps of the world, and um, possibilities, along with information in the actual world. Um, and we can go to the next slide. Um, and so on this uh, paper here suggests, oh, just a we, second, Savannah, what, what did you want? <laughs> okay. Um, so Amon's paper here is um, pointing out that, you know, the relevance of these models in cognitive science suggests that um, semantics, cognition, and perception are important processes that we should be paying attention to for um, computing applications um, and points out that this is sort of particularly relevant for high level problems. Um, and so we were thinking about examples of this in our discussions of the group and um, we're talking about the idea of sort of shopping for a first apartment after you graduate from high school. Um, so the idea being that, you know, you've never personally shopped for an apartment, uh, but you have all of this previous experience for shopping for other kinds of things um, that you can apply you know, that kind of knowledge you can apply to a new domain, even though you don't have any direct experience for this um, type of problem. And, you know, this example highlights that, you know, a lot of times we may have, um, you know, other types of information available, but not that are sort of uh, directly relevant to a particular problem in a computing context. And we need the ability to sort of transfer um, knowledge that we do have in order to make conclusions about new um, instances. And we can go to the next slide. So I'll take it from here. And uh, uh, this is uh, the paper discussed some of the ideas of previous uh, authors who had uh, the idea of artificial intelligence. So uh, John McCarthy uh, was the first to, to get this notion of artificial intelligence. 
uh, he described it as like it is a science and science engineering of making intelligent machine, especially intelligent computer programs. And uh, he talked about uh, various branches that he uh, that he thought that some of them are difficult and some of them will be achieved in a few years. He, he said that the common sense knowledge and reasoning will be most uh, tough to focus on, and least amount of the work is done in that in that respect. And learning from experience is uh, what he said to be deep learning and neural networks are right now. And uh, he put special emphasis on ontology and genetic programming as, as emerging areas of artificial intelligence paper. After that, to be, uh, after that uh, there is uh, another paper from uh, Mark Fisher, the computer of the 21st century. He described uh, computing as, the more, as uh, something which will disappear from the background. And uh, to give it an example, he, he gave a strong example of writing that mm -hmm. That is a representation of what we speak and what, and uh, to formulate it that uh, books are available everywhere, even internet is uh, filled up with writing, but it just disappears in the background. We don't think about it that much. Even this presentation is an example of that. And he said that uh, ubiquitous com computers will help over help overcome the problem of information overload. By import information overload, he says that when we uh, go out and take a walk in a in the woods. It's uh, yet we have a lot of information to be present of in the in our mind, but it's still relaxing while the computers are still frustrating. So we are very far away from that kind of uh, profound experience that just disappears in the background. Yes, we talked about that. And Jinendra, can you give me some dates on the question McCarthy and Wiser? McCarthy is going to be like 1960 yes. or something. <laughs> 56, okay. And then Wiser? Wiser was a recent And there was another paper on by CCL Lipleider. He, he, he got up more in the perspective of engineering of uh, this kind of machines. Man and he he goes on telling about the symbiosis between man and computers that it is uh, that such kind of system will really help in formulate uh, formulative thinking and and uh, and solving pro problems with human energy and that will help us uh, uh, think about uh, uh, that will help us in a synergy of synergy of doing making decisions and doing research and other tasks. For example, uh, uh, the question the question is not uh, we are seeing right now that what should be the answer to a particular question. It should be what should be the yes. next question. Like the machine should be able to give uh, uh, to to compute uh, n numbers of possible outcomes and give give <laughs> questions like why we will think uh, this approach will be better. This approach will lead to this many outcomes. So how are you going to Work upon it. So he 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 sort of convinced men computer uh, men and computers in in our working environment, and he proposed this uh, thing that uh, computers should be made in artificial intelligence, and computers should be made such as such. Year, year. Yes, uh, I'm not good with years, but I'll I'll get back to you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, you said it was earlier in the 70s and advisor, but our focus was on, you know, what the computer should, you know, how computers and interact with uh, and how uh, computing is made available to the human. Uh, I'm not, at least, I don't recall seeing um, particular, uh, you know, concrete ideas on what the machine is done to, to connect, um, uh, you know, to utilize. Whatever it has its disposal to solve the human needs. And um, so, uh, you know, you, you see people talk about perception, people talk about cognition. I think semantics was important because you need to connect data to the human. That is also equally important part for because computers would have access to a lot of data, humans have a lot of data. 
that you know the information that we get uh, to our brain, but uh, because who else you know that was already uh, going to all of uh, where to get you all kinds of data. Uh, so make you know you need to uh, make the data more meaningful uh, before you can apply cognitive processes or uh, before you can apply um, that is that is, that utilizes that is specific knowledge. And that is where um, you know, perceptual process don't have to uh, utilize knowledge per se. They can be able to do that directly. Um, but uh, that, in that sense, uh, and I wanted to, to show uh, the role of uh, you know, uh, knowledge in this process. So you can see there are some components that what each of the SCP do. But for example, as you know, the time that I had about uh, mm -hmm. people have the the 150 and 150 and G and that kind of thing. I try to do that similar thing uh, on, on the right hand side. So, Ahmed, are you thinking that knowledge is the bridge between system one and system two? Oh, yeah. That's the way so. it's, you're uh, it's, uh, posing it. Okay, because this has always been, from a cognitive science perspective, a sort of an awkward partition, but I, I see where you're going. So yeah, you've got. You know, both data and knowledge, that's why you know that you are looking at data and knowledge. Right? Yeah, okay. Uh, and then right. at least the distinction that you know, at least at the time we wrote this, we are um, not maybe talking about use of knowledge in this particular. Yeah. Uh, people were, you know, there, there was a lot of there was a lot of work and, and interesting knowledge representation um, in uh, 1980s. Certainly, but um, that event, as far as kind of you know, writing expresses. Yeah. That they would went into you know thinking about perception for cognition and mm -hmm. you know, uh, human uh, serving human needs a kind of level. Okay. So this was uh, at the time that this was being you know, those are the points I was thinking. It was true. Right. Um so moving on. Um so integrating the um Integrating perspectives from um, perception, cognition, and semantics um, provides the opportunity to create computing systems that um, can provide personalized recommendations, uh, provide better insights and recommendations than will be available otherwise, um, and contribute to novel insights that would otherwise not be available. Um, so Amit talks about this um, example of asthma management. Um, where you have, you know, a bit, you have a series of raw data about uh, a particular patient's um, asthma. Um, annotating that um, and then integrating that information with historical data from um, a specific person, as well as sort of knowledge basis and unstructured data about asthma in general, um, enables a physician to make um, conclusions that are um, specific to an individual person and account for their personal history. Um, and we can go to the next slide. So this is not being covered in the article, but I thought that it would be useful and it is like a future work after the article was written. So there are uh, inspiration from the neuroscience which have been uh, taken into artificial intelligence. Now we have seen that there are successful examples of reinforcement learning and the deep learning model. So if you see this architecture on the right hand side, this is open AI model architecture. Now it collects the data from users only and that it just retrain on after collecting data again and again. Uh, and chat GPT is now a very like hype thing. I don't know how many of you have been seeing this architecture or not, but this explains that, uh, that um, as more as data we will give, the knowledge we will give, our chat GPT model will perform the better and it will come up with better, better phases. So this is just an example of an inspiration of neuroscience, like how reinforcement learning can help. Now, what exactly are the expects which are inspired from brain? So first of all, it's brain memory. So like how we process each and everything into the daily life and all these computational tasks. Second is neurons. 
and the neurons are being including components in the artificial neural networks that are unique. And we have seen this spiking neural networks in the last few years that has been uh, a recent advancement of uh, neuroscience models that take uh, like spikes and, uh, and communicate as a neural component. Now, uh, it's, it's been like, I, I did get this fact, like uh, developing neural network took place not in mathematics or physics lab, but it is from the psychology and neuropsychology yeah. departments. Uh, we can go to the next one. Yeah, yes. And I did a bit more research about like where are being these brain spy models are being used. So in the table, these are all the uh, neuron models which are being uh, used from 1990s to till yet uh, to understand the structure of neurons and the analysis in the brain. And on the right side, I found exactly the paper. It's using three of the main models, that is Iziriki model, Hazin Hanki, and uh, one more model I forgot, sorry. But they are using these models to create the embeddings. And those embeddings uh, are based on the world models. And they are just comparing the like, classification task of, of the data set. So this work is being inspired from the neuroscience architecture. And this study was published in 2019. You can go to the next slide. Now I have been talked about uh, the neuroscience, uh, like cognitive neuro neuroscience review the book. And in that I covered all these aspects, which I will be talking now in terms of AI. So attention in neuroscience is like the key functions of man. man control, etc. But in AI, attention is something which is in between the layers of two, uh, two, two layers in the model. So attention is uh, the mean reduction, which we call, like it's trained from the gradient descent. And then in uh, attention in generative models are like the uh, real visual scenes. If we take the example of image classification, and we are incorporating the attention like mechanism over there in generative models. If you see the generation from the chat GPT, so it have our attention model in it. Can you see? Now this is this is the summary, like how attention is being used in AI, <laughs> and which is totally being inspired from psychology domain. So you can see that started started in 2014 and it's continuing till. I got a survey paper uh, that was published in 2022, but now we are in 2023. You can imagine that how many more papers have been published just on the advancement of the <clears throat> model. You can go to this. So just to uh, situate, this is the context of uh, uh, the semantic uh, social framework. All these methods, um, they're trying to say that uh, you create a, a neurally inspired architecture and you can go from raw data to giving the data some kind of semantic interpretation. Uh, so the output of all these systems is supposed to be the uh, data to semantically meaningful transformation. Mm -hmm. right? How do you provide semantically meaningful uh, outcomes? Uh, either you have a you know, knowledge of uh, Knowledge, uh, knowledge, uh, you know, language representation. Uh, you spell out something in language that you will understand, or you ground it in knowledge. Uh, what else can you do? Uh, and uh, one of these three really ground the things in knowledge. Uh, that is um, so. Uh, the, the way that this is sort of grounded in knowledge is this is all uh, trained with super from human generated data sets. So far as the training is successful in uh, capturing some uh, notion of what the human is thinking in its supervision labels or whatever else that they've quantified it as, this is grounded in human knowledge. So that's, uh, that's as far as- Yes. Uh, and and I want to look at the outcome and then say, this is the, Training that was given to what we got out of and to ground uh, in knowledge, and at least looking at this 
the question came out after all the situation that humans collectively decide mm -hmm. Wikipedia or Wikipedia or whatever, uh, you know, common uh, sense knowledge graph, then um, that's something humans understand. And uh, there's so much more you know, possible to convey to the other human. I mean, common understanding is there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've got to result. You can't tie easily to what you started with, what inputs you gave. Yeah, you understand that uh, the training helped you train the algorithm. Training was necessary to train the algorithm for it to work. But once the training is done, then it's, it's, it's a black box. So I totally argue your position all the time, but just for fun, I'll take the other one today. <laughs> so, so what is it about these systems that requires that kind of penetrability? We don't require that of our VCRs and we don't require that of our toasters and we don't really think deeply about our thermostats and we don't care. It's not relevant to us. What is it yeah, about this category? Just there about the most sets or whatever. They yeah. are not comparable. They're not trying to make sense of anything. They are just reporting. Well, uh, so is this. I mean, I'm, uh, you know, I argue your position, but I'm just playing devil's advocate. What What is it that is special about this application? So they were saying, uh, you see, uh, in set, they were. Uh, or somehow this uh, notion of uh, self supervision or mm -hmm. supervised learning or other things. Uh, humans give examples for them to learn. These and can cook up information as the other devices that you mentioned. Okay, so these can be wrong yeah. in serious ways. But your your automated toaster could be wrong in serious ways. You don't seem to stay up nights worrying about that. <laughs> I can fix the toaster. I think some people are trying. Is to it fix. the scope? Is it the scope of error, the cost of error, and the spread of error that is particularly problematic here that requires human supervision? Is it something uh, fundamental about? Is for learning, for these to learn and do better. You know, maybe some uh, support kind of tasks like uh, for NLP or computer vision. Uh, that that kind of task is what these uh, systems do. I, I think what, classification I think there's a certain diagnostic capability here too, and so like you know, presumably, um, you know, most people can sort of diagnose whether or not their uh, automatic toaster is performing to their you know expected standards. But you know, I think for oh. um, it's a lot more. It can be a lot more challenging to decide whether or not you know this AI system lives up to you know a particular standard for you know X task. Oh, so it's the ill-structured problem problem. Yeah, Where you I'd say that's at least goal? part of it. Yeah. Okay. Just to uh, follow up on that uh, again, coming back to the uh, making human experience easier part, we have the uh, which was. Which is uh, connected to uh, why this semantic cognitive perceptual model was created. Um, your toaster is broken, sure, but when you're using it, uh, you sort of uh, trust it. It's like things that Jinender was saying, it was disappearing into the background. You're no longer concerned deeply about the toaster anymore. And that is an artifact of uh, its diagnostic capability, like Savannah and stuff. Okay. Yeah, these things are uh, they create a lot of stress for a lot of people when using them for things yeah. that humans uh, should be uh, using them for, like decision support or something. Like that. Well, so as I said, I, I, I almost always argue that position, but I think it's really important for you to articulate exactly what it is that is critical about this, okay. that necessitates a different perspective. that uh, in memory in neurosciences, like how we think, reason, judge, and do decision. While in uh, AI, we have a model like LSTM, which can able to retain its memory. And uh, even after the, even after many of the thousands of training cycles, we had a 
like if you recall we had a good discussion about the episodic memory in neuroscience mm -hmm. and that is like a conscious of a pre previous experience so on base of that there is a model called deep q network which can just learn from the rapid behavioral change based in an individual experience that is called optimal policy change and it also works offline and it can be used on the past occurrences in the data set and can train it. <clears throat> And this is another example uh, from the computational perspective that in A and D, there are tasks on the cognitive behavior. So in A, they have uh, some, some, like, some of the tasks which will reward them. And in the B, they are showing some D. Sorry. In the D, they have some of the images which have some numbers or alphabets. So these kind of tasks are being given to the uh, brain and then they just check that which part of the brain is being active or it's been delayed in their uh, process of identifying these cognitive behaviors. Now, if there is a delay, then that could be, uh, that could be retrained after giving some like a re reward for probability or a reward to the brain. Like, if you if you ask a kid to do something and you treat them with a uh, toffee or a candy, so they will do it better the next time, and that is how our brain is being trained. Now in algorithms, we have this reinforcement learning technology like algorithm, which uh, which takes rewards from the environment and then just retrain its uh, network if it if it is. Uh, delaying or if it is not able to learn from the task which was provided earlier and it will improve its uh, learning over the time after learning from the data. So I have two questions. Uh, what is the relevance of this to semantic cognitive perceptual computing and how does adopting these kind of uh, techniques or algorithms would benefit or be key enablers for CH itself? Because so, if you if you see chat gpt it's a totally dependent on reinforcement learning not totally harsh. i mean if you see the architecture whatever they provided that's if you, just part of it right that's not the complete architecture of chat gpt itself but, rlhf is one component yeah and that is not the architecture right that is not but there is a part i agree that there is a part of reinforcement learning Okay. If that part is missing, then how it will be able to train itself on the data which we are providing now? So, would you be saying that ChatGPT is equivalent to what SCP are like it is following a part, cognitive perception? Yeah, a part of signature. No, really not. Uh, I think uh, you're, right now you're not making any uh, good connection with the four, uh, uh, what you call four ideas presented in SCP. I think you're throwing uh, something well, there. I would yeah. say, I would say that. To, uh, see, there is a attempt, there's an attempt. Uh, this is what also Raj Vigli liked. There's an attempt to connect um, uh, the uh, perception and system one kind of thing to cognition system two kind of thing in the presence of data, uh, you know, and knowledge. So uh, that, uh, you know, there is a um, role of, uh, of data and perception is uh, by that. There is uh, knowledge there, uh, you know, ontologies are discussed there, you know, the, that comes with information. And then also with the lifting, uh, you know, so you're lifting the data into uh, semantic space or, you know, connecting with knowledge. Let me make a guess about where this might be going. Uh, I haven't read this paper, but I think what's going on here is the need for a much more rigorous concept of working memory and that working memory and reinforcement learning need to be considered together and that working memory is an important concept in attention and, and control that is not properly exploited in reinforcement learning. That'd be my guess. Savannah, is is this an end back task? 
penalty. Um, I mean, it looks like an end back pass. <laughs> yeah, that's what it looks like to me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the way I draw connection from this is like uh, uh, in the in in the perceptual computing we have already built information, right? And we provide information to to already build information to uh to get cognitive uh inference. So uh such a system like Chat GPT has some already built application and already built information and then we provide information in our context to get cognitive inference from it mm -hmm. uh, like uh, for, for many many examples of course has demonstrated that uh, that he explains the environment and then he asks the questions so that that is sort of the connection that i that i thought this can be useful for I don't think that's inconsistent with what I'm saying. Yeah. There's another process here that you guys haven't worried about that that controls the focus of attention and manages the goal stack and manages what you pay attention to in the environment. And that thing in cognition is called working memory. Uh, yeah, so um, isn't, isn't maintaining a goal stack uh, a very hard problem when it comes to uh, open domain language. Yeah, it is, but clearly we can do it, right? Probably. So then, well, no, I'm pretty sure we can manage multiple goals and main, and, and managing a goal stack. And there's tons of research on, on that in human yeah. cognition. So I think that's the hook. This, this, it, it, it's not, the problem is not the insight that Amit has regarding the role of semantics and connecting perception and cognition. I think we're all good on that. The problem has to do with the control over the cognitive processes and the inferences that are made. And us cognitive scientist types can't see how you can do that without some kind of notion of working memory that prioritizes context and prioritizes current goals. So, you have some sensory input observation, 150, and you need to go to something actionable, such as uh, take the, uh, uh, are you taking the pressure uh, pill uh, regularly? Does your um, uh, medication need adjustment? Right? Those are actions, right? Some observations, a lot of things happen. And I explicitly draw attention to the um, change in the level of abstractions that are necessary for, to go from the data to the decisions and the actions. So a CP is really um, around uh, explaining that, that you have this data and ultimately come with the explanation. And in that context, you have this Part, part of process we call perception, part of process we call semantic, part of process we call cognitive. Mm -hmm. okay? um, that is the important thing. If you are not traversing that uh, you know, levels of section from raw data to um, uh, the high abstraction where you can take an action or make a decision, then you are not talking apple and apple. Then you talk about something else, you know, where uh, yeah, a classification can be called as a, uh, you know, uh, an activity that takes you to a high level of section, but it's a very fixed and limited form. You give a, uh, you know, data and it classifies, puts you in the bin, bin, or that you're predicting the next word. Yeah, this, there is certainly some level of intelligence being able to predict the next word, but it's a very limited form of, of what it is. Now, you have a wonderful, you know, current system made wonderful use of the simple capability of, well, relatively simple capability of um, predicting the next word, trained on massive data into something that looks very intelligent, like creating the question. Right? That, that is the intelligent part. But it is, it's a different thing. Uh, it's not in the, the more, the important thing here is really to, understand the core thing about going from uh, you know observation and sensory inputs and data uh, as something low level 
or audit and text to actions. And that there is a, so, so the argument is that uh, in, in, in one of the previous meetings I had uh, uh, talked about it. Um, a very simple thing would be that you have, um, so remember Cody's work where you have observations coming in, you have Intelligo that helps you run kind of the machinery. The abductive process, you create hypothesis to satisfy a, a hypothesis, you have deductive processing to look for more observations that is supplied and ultimately the hypothesis is uh, you know, defined and uh, validated for some peak interaction. But this is now a fire made of, uh, it's a chemical fire or, or wood fire. Mm -hmm. And then you can take the action for that, right? So that, that process is there, right? That process um, is another, not the same exact uh, activity, but similar thing is the idea that, uh, you know, we built based on Kahneman's work on system one, low level processes, system two, higher level community processes, right? Mm -hmm. And now my hypothesis is that there's no, it's not that simple as low level process, high level process like that. There is a series of, uh, you know, uh, low level, little higher, level one higher to level two higher, level two higher to level three higher, that thing is going on. And these are all different levels of abstractions. Mm -hmm. Just as in the pyramid, there are different levels of abstraction. Yeah, the pyramid is very clear, right? And I think it's very simple. And I have myself not seen anything that clean as that 150 to 150 MMFG to elevated blood pressure to <coughs> diagnosing what it is, to, you know, then uh, whether it is hypothetical. Uh, 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 what is it? Hypertension uh, or hypotension? Hi, hi, it's hypo. <laughs> so, so whatever that was, you know, no, the thyroid thing or oh, okay, Hyper hyperthyroid. Yeah. So those are the options because of which you can have. Uh, well, this is why you can have high elevated blood pressure. Mm -hmm. El you know, elevated blood pressure is just a middle condition, not the one you can act upon. Act upon to act upon something, you need to know whether it's blood pressure or it is. Other, other diagnosis, right? Mm -hmm. And you don't jump all the way from uh, just the number to that, that there are levels of abstraction. This is why uh, uh, many of us, and I have talked about the importance of abstraction from the very beginning, right? And if we recognize that this is intermediate level of abstraction, see, in a deep neural network, there are layers, and there is clearly level of abstraction, but you don't have any handle on that, right? You don't, it's, it, it's not, can you, there is a, a, a loose understand from pixels you get to uh, some, you know, uh, uh, a, a, some high level picture from which you get to uh, high, uh, something you get to, uh, you know, you can also bring in the texture and other things, then uh, and color, and then you go to contours also, and, and then you get to object. Right? So there is a, these are levels of abstraction in vision, right? Uh, but there's no concrete control there. But if you had semantics, if you had supported by knowledge, then you'll be able to make each of the, uh, you know, landing for different layers concrete, right? Because you will connect with the uh, knowledge and knowledge represented can be uh, low level concept to high level concept, right? So that this, this, uh, this insight is very important. At least that's what I, I, I like to advocate that, um, you have level of, level of abstractions that at each other level of abstraction, you can make the level, uh, the landing, uh, you know, uh, more concrete by again, try to the uh, knowledge uh, that you may have available or some way to describe it semantically. Uh, and, and you, as you go up, the semantic levels uh, go up, you know, the higher level of semantic abstraction, uh, there's a lot of things conveyed in um, uh, saying that, I'm going to uh, give you calcium, calcium channel to blocker uh, based medication for uh, hypertension uh, management. Starting from some, uh, you know, blood pressure input over the period of time, doctor asking you the questions, uh, uh, whether you are exercising or not, lifestyle thing, salt intake, so many other things are being asked, eventually leading to the doctor prescribing you the medication uh, with certain 
you know, take uh, one template over the night uh, of uh, this thing, which is a calcium channel blocker or beta blocker, or this the seven type of medications that you took from that loaded data. So the power to me, what attracts is that we all are able to take in so many types of data, so many types of sensory input, so many, uh, and we are using broad variety of knowledge and experiences we have, ultimately coming to uh, the decision and actions we make. So, that is the very powerful part to me, that, is, that aspect of AI is very, very powerful. Ahmed, I think our paper with Hammond is really helpful here, okay. illustrating the, the levels of knowledge. So we were talking about the problem of medicating a senior citizen and just considering that problem from the perspective of of the physiological and physical situation and then adding in the family considerations and then adding in the cultural considerations where you want to take the patient out on a trip to re, to i don't know meet with the rest of the family etc so when you put all of that in the mix the decision about how you choose a medication becomes enormously complicated that paper essentially portrays dimensions of you know yeah the, the multiple dimensions and now what a cognitive scientist would say about this is you run the risk of combinatoric explosion in a system like that and so you have to consider how you're going to manage it and and the cognitive scientist would say it's all about working memory and the current goals that are focusing attention and they can change in my view hmm? that is too simplistic in my view Okay. okay. Well, you need some kind of control. No, you do, but <laughs> I, I think this uh, thing, the architecture I portrayed, where you are transcending the levels of abstraction, each time using different computation mechanisms. Uh, so, uh, again, along with this idea, first, what I know to do is to also show that um, at the lower level, I'm using the data centric mechanisms. And then I go at the high level. And I'm using more, uh, you know, knowledge centric mechanisms, reasoning, uh, you know, uh, that I'm doing. So uh, we talk about, uh, you know, uh, supporting variety of um, computational frameworks, but there are some frameworks that are appropriate for data, and uh, the other frameworks that, you know, a massive amount of many data points, mm -hmm. many many points of input. Uh, the higher level of abstraction go, each point is very bulky, very meaningful. It has, it's like cluster of a uh, lot mm -hmm. into one level. Uh, and then you are acting on far fewer things. You are also working on slowly, you are deliberating. For example, the higher up you go, you're going to begin a uh, look at the things from multiple dimension. This uh, you know, article that one is talking about, uh, that we did, you know, we look at from ethical dimension, looking from uh, cost dimension from effectiveness dimension, looking from uh, you know um, uh, societal dimension. Those things that they are deliberate, and there are more pros and cons, and then you make the choices. And the low level, you can be statistical. You can be, you know uh, just like perception is very fast and you know, immediate and uh, compile. Uh, there is a long time ago, 1988 uh, 99, uh, we did work on AI database integration. And so we talked about compiled to interpreted form of AI. Mm -hmm. Okay, so compiled form, immediate decision. Uh, of course, it takes a while to compile, but then give the data, you get the output. Anyway. Interpreted takes time, go bobbling around here and there, and then using the thing, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so again, another interesting possible dimension, which I have not figured out, is that you go from more compiled form of uh, computation to more interpretive and deliberative form of computation. Mm -hmm. So, so the concept of um, and, and all of this is kind of uh, intermediated or, or, or what you call it, modulated by or, or modularized by this concept of abstraction. Mm -hmm. Things are pretty complicated. The abstraction gives you. Yeah, let's go there by there. Let's go. That'll let's work see. for some stuff. But in cognition, we have this remarkable capability to go back and look at the data. So you are describing a pretty serial process, a progression from the data to the cognition. I'm not and I think describing the serial. I am simply describing the serial. How are you going to get from the top back down to influence the processing that's going on at the perceptual level? You need to be able to do that. Yeah, you could do that. So 
I'm not uh, uh, counting out uh, jumping the level. Uh, you can jump from the top level to bottom level, and that's fine too. So that's going to. I mean, you have this kind of you know, uh, you know, cyclical thing that stack up, but uh, there can be cycles that can go any level. So then the, the higher order knowledge is going to start to control the processing that's going well, on at the lower level. You yeah, have to so, have that, so, and I think that's what we mean by working. Well, there's, there can be short circuits, right? So if, if, uh, if an object is hurling towards your face, uh, and you decide to duck the thing, and then you observe what the hell was it, or you know, uh, or, or or you prepare for the next thing, uh, that thing, you know, acted very fast and short circuited a lot of things, and it remained largely perceptible. That there was not much of a cognitive. But that's not the really, I mean, that's a problem. And, and that's a that's a problem that Simon recognized. And I think I talked to the group about that earlier. The problem is you are way up in the stratosphere reasoning about some abstract issue. And now you have to go down back into the data to say, oh, wait a minute, I better check X. I have to reinterpret the situation. That, that is being discussed in the person. That is I'm going to discuss. Oh, so you are going to get there yeah. if we let you. <laughs> yeah, you can go to next slide. Uh, anyway, so we will uh, after the slides we can come back to question. But I really like to that question and we can cut the opportunity. Okay, so in reception from there was a discussion about how we can uh, adequately address the relationship between the data interpretation and the environmental exploration or interactions what we have. So in uh, like in concept of continual learning in neuroscience, so we encounter over multiple events and we just learn from it continu continuously. So with respect to that, the present AI systems like deep RL network or AutoML, they have a support of continual learning at a large scale. Now, AutoML is something like which we can deploy on uh, deploy on the cloud and if we can support with it. Uh, Continuous data that will that will actually uh, address the relationship between the interpretation and learning of learning from the interpretations, which uh, Dr. Chita talked about in his paper. Now the next next thing was that uh, no 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 next thing. <laughs> so the next thing was that uh, in the paper it was discussed that uh, we should be able to support that. Uh, like how the complex things uh, in the data can be answered and can be, um, so they they should have a people's ability to answer these uh, complex questions. So then that comes from the imagination and planning part mm -hmm. from the neuroscience perspective. And now we have these uh, generative models. The, the, those generative models are able to answer the question on like question answer systems and then to take uh, how to take decisions. If you have listened the podcast which Dr. Shed has shared earlier the last week, and that talks actually about how people are using it, like GPT-3, that people have used it for positive affirmation and it's it's been used for like uh, GPT-4 have uh, GPT-3 that that takes GPT-3 or 4, which takes the visual thing, mm -hmm. GPT-4, yeah. So GPT-4 takes the visual thing and then it gives us like the word that can be made out from this uh, refrigerator. So that's being done this in the present, like uh, we are taking an uh, inspiration from the perceptual computing role mm -hmm. and we have this human cognition, which human cognition data which have uh, been using these kind of massive data and these generative models are out now. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, one second. Just a quick question. Can you uh, reiterate the point uh, related to continual learning in AI with auto -MS? Yeah, so that was for uh, the PC's role. Like it can be learned from the integration of the more data. And if you are feeding more data, then it will be come up with a actionable output. Right, but so at least from what I understand about continual learning and what you just mentioned, I, I think uh, those two are a little different. 
continual learning uh, specifically focuses on that you remember. So as any of these models do, if I include the data, there is a chance that what they have learned from the previous data, they, they might lose that information. But in continual learning, uh, they what, will retain that information and then take that's the out. that's the aim that you retain the previous information or you at least retain the important uh, ideas from the previous work mm -hmm. or previous things that you have learned. So right. auto ML actually supports that if you give more data to it, then it will be able to learn better on this thing. On the new data. The, on the new data. Yeah. And it, it there is retained. catastrophic forgetting always present in LLMs, right? So the yeah. previous data is always affected. But so the previous domains on which it is trained on, the performance uh, suffers at least. Dr. Das can correct me if I'm no, no, go on. <clears throat> Would it be affected? Like in no, AutoML is not the you know, what Deepa is trying to draw analogy. It's absolutely not that purpose. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I, I believe what Rebati presented that that's the that's the purpose of AutoML. So there are a like lot of models finding the problem. Yeah, you don't know hyperparameters, etc. You want to do it automatically. So this is absolutely wrong. What Deepa is trying to say. But there is a continual learning part in AutoML that yeah, AutoML is just a framework which probably enables that. So it's something mm -hmm. similar to Revati's architects or the system that she has built, right? You give a set of domain problem and you find the correct kind of parameters and maybe continual learning is something that they've integrated into it. But continual learning in AI is not defined by author. It's, a it's like these are two examples of continual learning where we are used. So the first point makes sense. But the second point is just something that at least from what is my understanding of author like what I understand from it, I don't think it has continual learning, or at least I haven't come up with it. to continue learning, say you have a very large audience, right? And you have trained a trillion parameters. What happens when you see a new example, uh, what they call field shot for the auto learning, mm -hmm. is a step of the same thing. I don't know if you're, you're aware of this. Uh, uh, the recent work has shown that. Uh, at the instance time, a step of optimization. So, that is why you the at training time, your language model, though it is trained, you so have to get in detail for some variant of it, has actually learned method in the system. So, it supports a set of learning goals through this automatic building of language model. That's, that's what the how the automatic ties into continual learning goals. Uh, Put this seed of an idea. Current AI systems are being very, uh, traveling very small distances to some level. Mm -hmm. They're doing point to point tasks. Starting with old AI systems, which may be classification, very simple, reasonably basic thing, or predicting the next word, um, you know, or uh, uh, recommending. Uh, you know, so ranking essentially uh, of, of the choices we have. Um, compared to the activities that we human do, um, and it's what is required for our existence and experience, that there are a lot of things that come our way, a lot of data out there, and we make few conscious decisions compared to the data, we make few conditions. And the distance we travel, yes. From the input to the outcome is very vast. It's and it's also complicated. Yeah. I wonder whether so, and that is what SCP is. You know, uh, it's not SCP is not a vision for uh, you know. Uh, you know, I, I was not trying to do what uh, ChatGPT would do or uh, you know any any other things. It was not that mm -hmm. related to a very complete and narrow task. So now that there are all these wonderful, uh, you know, uh, components, uh, you know, solutions out there, is it possible for us to visualize how you go from the this raw data to the decisions and action, and uh, say that you know, say you are an architecture with semantics, cognition, percep perception, cognition. But now we know how to actually realize it. Pieces of them very well, and they, they uh, you know, stack pieces. Better. 
we are in a rat race to solve one problem incrementally better. And sometimes we have made bigger than incremental progress, significant progress. Even jump looks bigger. I you know in some of the recent things, jump on that particular task looks bigger. And it probably is bigger uh, compared to very municipal thing. You know, so many deep learning models there, and then slowly, you know, uh, the application wise, the, uh, this, you know, looks like we travel a long distance. But all that is within a very limited part of the uh, intelligence, human intelligence, or what we think human intelligence. SCP is about, you know, probably human intelligence that go from low level data to decisions and action. That is what it was positioned for. In that context, can we say we? I need all these things. I give, I give my best shot at this SCP and different points in that. Can you guys come up with something that is the same? We have now more concrete handling. And we can put this thing and this thing and this thing together. Uh, there may be, uh, you know, perception of a very high level of AI progress because a lot of things are happening in a very narrow area of, uh, the, what, you know, of what humans do. And the intelligence. There are a lot of other things you know that nobody's paying, you know, not yet much is happening because it's too hard or or, or, or it doesn't have you know, immediate business when you are this. Right? So this is that is what thinking. Meaning people are thinking right now, um, sort of just in horizontal thing. Uh we can start thinking about the vertical thing, vertical in the sense abstractions, years of abstraction. There is a, a paper I wrote. Uh, uh, was it in semantic scales of paper? Uh, you guys remember a paper I wrote on called semantic scales of? And, uh, or, or, oh no, or the paper on, um, uh, uh, just, I like to hear. Quite natural, so much good. Because, uh, you know, uh, because the, uh, what the paper, a uh, Borel Asher Bach uh, book, mm -hmm. the, the, the mm -hmm. eternal triangle or whatever, you know, great, 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 golden braid. Right? Yeah. That, that. Mm -hmm. Masterful title, masterful work. Uh, this is Mila Michel's, uh, you know, advisor. Oh, no, no, was it? This was it? That's yeah. interesting. Okay, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. Good enough. So, Hoxar, this is Hoxar, a brilliant work. That's, that's really that and Telltale tell Brain are my absolute favorite work. Anyway, so can we now, uh, you know, think along that? Uh, oh, sorry. So, that, that, that paper was on um, uh, physical cyber social computing. And there I have horizontal operations and vertical operations. Look it up. Just there is one diagram. Look it up. You get it. Similarly, what I feel is that there is a going to horizontal at different levels, and there isn't much going on the vertical uh, you know, operations. Traversing the levels of abstractions is what I would call now. By thinking along that line, we could be solving, uh, you know, a, a, a very refreshing and new generation. New, Playing in your own sandbox as opposed to you know doing what others are doing. So think think a lot of I think what you're saying is consistent with my frustration. I feel like you guys need an architecture. I'm just not. I just don't have the big picture of how all these pieces fit together. And Mega and Vapula, you know, you were working on that at your keynote, but I don't. I'm not feeling like you're there yet. But I think that would help enormously. Um, Newland Simon wrote a really nice paper called You Can't Play 20 Questions with Nature and Win. And the argument in that paper is you can't look at these little narrow siloed problems and expect that the solutions to each one of them are somehow going to add up into a system that can predict behavior. I think you're in the same kind of yeah. situation. So, so if, uh, uh, if you... Uh... At least two of my recent comments are uh, uh, on LinkedIn, where in this dimension, yep. where I particularly talk about the need for uh, having, uh, you know, you're doing all this in the text, and humans are many, the many tasks that require you to know the uh, real world, mm -hmm. you have world model, and what is the situation in the world. Yeah. And of course, uh, 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 in this uh, so called powerful language model just working on this purpose has no idea this, yeah. of uh, going beyond what from that, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, from that data they are fed. Amazing amount of processing on data in that, but that can't replicate exactly that point, uh, you know, that uh, 20 question uh, idea. Yeah. And that simply can't replace the fact that the uh, fact has changed now. 
Yeah. That, that, you know, Trump is no longer president or whatever happened. Yeah. That I'm, so, you know, that, that I had this crisis and now I'm doing something else. So nothing, you know, uh, uh, so, so we are a system that moves. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Dr. Yeah. Seth, I think it's not a closed system anymore with the recent, the chat GPT plugins or I, I think it's called plugins that they have released. Uh, it accesses real world data at real time and answers based on that. So there is one plugin which is for retrieval purposes. Yeah, so technically we can discover any content that is present on the world wide web. You can put any website, any PDF document and interactively talk to it. Well, then how are you going to control that process? If you can plug in, that means you're going to uh, control on one step. So that you don't go all over the place. I mean, you, you so that you don't get distracted. We can choose what. Let's say. Okay, so, that, so that's you. That's not the machine. That's being intelligent. You're, you're loading the intelligence and the and the control on the process. It's you. Mechanism. It's not bad. It's just important but to realize. Does it really, uh, you know, work? Any uh, uh, close to how you do it? Like close to like all of them. Well, yeah, but on the other hand, I'm not entirely convinced that that's your job. It might be my job to understand how humans think about things, but I'm not entirely convinced that you need to replicate human cognition in order to provide an intelligent service to humans. No, Valerie, yes, you can. Um, I think that um, uh, the, if your brain is simply uh, working on, a, you know, say, you know, on the computation that, um, uh, uh, let's see your, your brain, this guy's really device to transform a model. That is a very level, different level of thing uh, as opposed to having inspiration from uh, uh, other fields. Okay. And and uh, you, you look at um, in uh, 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 we, we talk about uh, people like uh, Nick Lider, We talk about uh, Oliver Bush. We talk about these. Whether you know whatever the field they are, they are their their field of vision is pretty broad. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and not something very narrow. So um, uh, there are there will be some of these guys who continue to do classical computer scientists and classical AI work, while the others would um, you know uh, get inspiration from other fields and come up with a very different architecture, very different way of thinking. That others are not doing. Well, I certainly agree and with that. That will, that is when I think they can, you know, really rise to some uh, thing. So I think people they can choose some sort of engineering, uh, uh, you know, work, or they can, you know, say uh, 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 even two of these become future big innovators, uh, were inspired by ideas from various people. Uh, you know, I mean, today so much, so much of our discussion still goes in system one, system two, and that guy is a, an economist. Yeah. So I I agree with that. I I I don't I don't disagree at all. I think the point that I'm making is more of a Mitchell point in that original article. It's not necessarily the case that the computational systems that you provide mimic the same processes as human processes. They should be explainable. But, you know, I'm just thinking about how I interact with any one of you or with Amit here. I don't talk to Amit because he thinks exactly like me. <laughs> I, th I talk to Amit because there's some kind of overlap, but he thinks about things in a different way. I think he talks to me because I think about things in a different way. So it's, it's not necessarily the case that the computation has to do the same thing, has to think about things as a human, but there does have to be ontological overlap in them, I think. Um, there also, in my view, needs to be, um, there's a ground truth machinery that has to go into the computing. For example, I hear a lot of people have, make this argument that birds flap their wings, but they yes. don't, right? that's right. That is, uh, um, 
that that is not a very well reasoned argument, I think, because uh, really what's going on is birds are flapping their wings to create a pressure differential between the top part of the wing and bottom, mm -hmm. and planes are doing that to a rocket strapped to their back. But the aerodynamic design is still inspired by the birds. Mm -hmm. And the ground level machinery is achieving the same thing, the test pressure differential. So similarly, since we are the one building the machine, we need that's to, pretty clever. <laughs> I'm going to think about that one. <laughs> that's a really good one. <laughs> the keeper. <laughs> uh, Absolutely disagreed. We'll talk about this. Later. <laughs> So there's a level of analysis at which the functions are comparable, is what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, there's also just a, there's also a, you know, what do my, what do your users expect from the system perspective? And so like, there's a aspect of you know, if I'm interacting with, you know, a uh, virtual assistant or ChatGPT or whatever, what are my expectations about what that system should be able to do? And how can you replicate those sorts of aspects as well? I think that's a great point. So the, one of the issues here is the degree of interaction that's expected. And to the extent that you need to collaborate with this machine, as opposed to just you know, get spoon fed its answers, your requirement for understanding what the machine is doing really increases. Ah. This is the AI generated image. They <laughs> asked what Chris Strokes saw when Will Smith said. <laughs> see, see what it looks like. Okay. Oh. This is completely generated by AI. No, interesting. So now we talk about like what's in the future. So as a paper discussed that uh, we we need a synergy between all these social. It's SP, we need a complementary and a synergistic between these two. So I hope that uh, chat GPT plugins are dealing with these big data challenges, which are being discussed into the paper. And as far as now we are are uh, some amount of like rele relevant knowledge or improvement or data or like a decision making is being uh, done by like decision making on the previous word like what word could be the predicted next that kind of thing is being done by generative models now uh, but there is something which is missing it's like abstraction like amount of multi model data or uh, how we can combine all these data and, and combine and build a model out of that. For doing that, we need to really understand the human capacity. And uh, to understand that, we we need to first see that, like, how we can uh, correlate these things. So there is a study being done that, um, this major article, that has been seen that how GPT Two, that was on GPT-2, how it is uh, correlated with the actual brain at the same So people are now trying to understand that uh, are these generative models have any uh, information which you can relate to human brain. Mm -hmm. So that kind of studies are being doing to improve these models. Um, so the thing which came up with that, uh, that article was that the lack of predictive coding theory. Now, what it is, maybe you can explain better, but yeah. Predictive fine. coding theory? No, I don't know. I don't know that. Okay. I'm thinking about something else. I'm thinking about so it, it's, it's Federenko. Uh, <laughs> what the sen sensory input we are giving to our human brain. So our brain is uh, depend on like the top down prediction like how it is doing the right do, do what we what we have the output in our action now we have to really understand that model of brain and try to come up with a symbiotic relationship between brain and the ai to improve these models okay and that connects with the comment that i made to amit earlier about the fact that you need top down influences yes. on the processing of experience perceptual experience 
You've got to have that. Because a discrepancy between what you're expecting to see and what you do see is a very important cue about whether or not things are proceeding nominally and you can just walk through the forest as planned or you need to do something else. Yeah, I, I, this is something interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I will show you the examples. Uh, so this is an example for you. <laughs> I was showing it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that if, if you ask a prompt, a proper prompt that I need a model pipeline explaining data extraction, model training, grid search, and the five cross validation. So you can see what it is generating. Can you go to the next one? So it is generating a pipeline, which you can see that is not really a pipeline of what we want on our machine on. And it is giving us model explaining or whatever uh, prediction it is giving. So it is not an accurate thing to ask <coughs> machines to come up with our architecture or create, create models uh, which we can use in our scientific articles. <laughs> Now, if we ask the same thing to the Google knowledge, like it is giving it's a science engine which is using Google knowledge graph. Now, these three outputs that came across in my Google search that was way more far better than yeah. those uh, Dali search which was generated. So, so Deepa, uh, I think here it's all about the prompt engineering. So, how you are asking. Uh, Good prompt. I mean, more than the prompt, I think it's the data on which the model is trained on. So, mm -hmm. Dali is an imaginative pick image generator model. It's, yes. I don't think it is trained on generating full sets. Maybe in the future, yeah. somebody would do it. But yeah, that was not possible using this. I just used this an example. And then we can. And these are human curated images that are indexed on the web. So, yeah. Oh, they are. It's just a retrieval thing. It's not a construction thing, just retrieval. Mm -hmm. So I think it's not a uh, Apple graphic. Yes. But if you want to come up, uh, like if you want to make an image or a mm -hmm. scientific algorithm, if you want to take an inspiration from a DALI or from a Google search, which you will be considering, of I'll course. Create you will. My yeah, right. well, yeah, <laughs> of course you will. <laughs> Yeah, like you have to come up with your own thing, but if you want to take and just an inspiration to how to create that uh, image, to convert your ideas into an image, you have to. I mean, Deepa, just to say it in a funny way, uh, if I want to search for a research problem, I would not go and read Harry Potter, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> oh, I might be, you might get it. That'd be a really good idea. An outside the box thing. But that was just an example. Yeah, no, that's good. Provocative. Now we have uh, eight, uh, eight minutes. We have one. Eight, 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 eight minutes, minutes. <laughs> to solve all the world's problems. That, okay. that should work pretty well. So, uh, what we were going to do is uh, have the panelists talk about questions, but since we have eight minutes, I'll just read out the questions and anyone can talk on it. So, the first question is uh, Architectural authorities as well as an architecture good enough for semantic cognitive perspective? Just this particular question, I'll take for a second because we have. Uh, Question is relevant to this. So, uh, again, semantic cognitive perceptual computing for human experience, that entire mouthful. Every part of it does that, uh, does the LLM architecture cover. And I think uh, uh, actually, uh, so let's uh, see what is happening. It takes the raw data and then uh, generates text, right? So, you, you can uh, maybe uh, believe that uh, semantics is modeled because it is able to generate plausible looking text. Implicitly, it is much somewhere, and uh, not maybe the full extent that you would require, but it is somewhere. Here. And then the cognition aspect, which is act on that implicitly model semantics, you have the argument. Okay? So you instruct it to do something and it acts on it. So uh, is semantic perceptual cognitive captured in modern day LLM? A weak flavor is, I do believe. And about the human experience piece, is it easy for you to interact with uh, systems like? That KPT to get it to do what you want. If you think the answer to that is yes, then I am nobody to argue with that. I just, for me, it is a tedious experience to get it to do what I want. So I don't think the human experience is covered yet. And it's not just because it's not very easy to use for, for my purposes, it's also because I 
the toaster example, which is to say you can forget about what it is doing at least because mm -hmm. you trust that the toaster works. So that part is told in that. Uh, any real very carefully need to think about what that CPT is giving you an output. So uh, that is uh, uh, taking away from my human experience. And then the ease of use comes later. I hope that. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, question two is um, how can we think about designing systems that do this better? What we talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, and question three is. Uh, a more um, maybe concrete level discussion. How do we think of the architecture? So, yeah, those are the great questions. Anyone feel free to jump in. Can I make some comment? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Jinan, you make analogy with LSTM and whatever memory, right? Can you go to the board and you know explain me how LSTM work, all the mathematics? Now, I try to. I no, no, don't do it. Don't. Do it. I'm just asking. You mean, questions. Sit down. Oh. Okay. So if you can't, yeah. so we are only telling story. Deepa, you talked about attention mechanism. How many attention exist today in neural network architecture? What are the categories? Three, four, five. What are the names? One. <laughs> There is nothing like that. I... See, you don't know. So, see, we are only telling stories. We are repeating the same story every day. But we don't know how to work. We don't know the mathematics. So, we are just talking. So, this is actually, you know, you know draw me back. So, uh, a lot of things are happening. Just, uh, let's just... Uh, Koshik, you know, shared this your screen. I just sent a picture, uh, you know, over the uh, group, you know, subject chat. Okay, by the way, who can who can go now and uh, you know do the LSTM for me? How it works, mathematics? Who can do it? Anybody? Any student? Okay, we are computer science students, right? <laughs> so this is this is this is uh, being generated by AI. Somebody asked what Chris Rock saw when Will Smith slapped him using AI. You talked about Dali. This is made Johnny Five, okay. and this came out yesterday. But Doctor, yeah. why is LSTM uh, deeply rooted and uh, no, my no, no, I'm not. See, I I got your all the point philosophy. Okay, but philosophy is not only science. We have to also talk about science. How it works? Do you know the mathematics? If you don't know, how can you contribute to make it better? So if I'm working on LSTM, I'll surely be responsible for hmm. No, not no, working on LSTM. You want you you are trying to develop something better than LSTM. So you have to know how LSTM works, right? So we, we have already something better than LSTM, right? So then you do you know how that system works? So you have to work better on that, right? So you have to you have to know, right, how it works. You have to know the mathematics, you have to know that machinery, how it works. We have to discuss more about that. Anyway, so this is generated by AI. Uh, so do you believe this is just you know generated by AI? Yeah? No, it's not not photograph for sure. Okay. No, it's not photograph. Means it wasn't as that uh, you should give me a picture of how he was looking when he was slapping from mm -hmm. the other side, but it's the view. So, means of course it's not a photograph that we know already because that wasn't the query any. It's still it's the it. it does it, it, this this is supposed to portray the point of view of Chris Rock of what he saw. Right? And if somebody were to capture it, this, this is probably exactly the kind of I think something's really wrong with this face. Now, I don't have any. It's it, messing in any way. Uh, you know, the fact, the fact that you just moved what was means that tells you know, this person here. And, by the way, why is this guy? Yeah. What is, what is that? Different points of time. Even there are similar images, I just put one. Yeah, but there's something really wrong with this. 
I don't think uh, that you can operate your forehead in opposite ways like this. It is a it uh, is yeah. not. <laughs> it's not. It, there's something not right about it. So I think you either you either both eyebrows go up at the same time like this, or you go. And I'm sorry, Savannah, can't see. Or you know, you you scrunch your forehead like this, but I don't think you can scrunch one side and raise the other side, and so it's just not no. it's not right. No, 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 Sharon. I think you do. There are uh, I don't know what is exactly the dance form in India, but there are dance. What is it? Kathakali. Kathakali. People like those dances do it like with your forehead. Yes, but not someone when slappy. <laughs> well, maybe. <laughs> so, so it's not a realistic thing. It's not a real image or it's just a very wonderful picture for a perspective on what the question is asked. Or the question that is asked, uh, uh, I mean, even the fact that the system have as a uh, sense of uh, person coming at you. There's a lot of uh, possible. Of course, can you open the next one? Say Mid Jenny Five. So, uh, Savannah's trying to get a word in edgewise here, too. Savannah? Somebody I... asked Mid Jenny Five, uh, Neanderthal people are taking selfie. <laughs> so, this is what brings it. Maybe holding Yeah, that's what it is. Doctor, huh? but how would I relate the math? <laughs> no, no, see, my my point is my my simple point is you know, what I you know always I mean this is my opinion I mean take it or leave it we are not discussing enough technique enough mathematics enough enough you know uh, methods so there are a lot of good things happening we have to discuss about it I mean if we I mean if we just say nothing good is happening and if we just talk about you know take a back seat of it we don't discuss mathematics statistics mathematics and solid things we we'll, you know, it's hard to learn. I mean, it's my take. Uh, we should discuss more about techniques. So, uh, I mean, if you if you want to criticize that, even that, you know, for that reason also, you should know what is happening. No, I agree with the inner, you need to know what what is the inner right. work that is going on in the model. Right. But in spite of knowing what self attention formulation is and what multi head self attention formulation right. is, how would I make like I'm at least myself I'm not so, 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 same question. Can you make me understand? Let's say, as you, I don't know, how many different kind of attention exist today, how they work. Can you work down the mathematics to me? If you can't, then you don't know. You are just talking surface level. You are playing with words. So, but, sir, the yeah. question is that so let's hmm. say he knew all the self attention formulas. Hmm. Then what would we do? Still doesn't teach him anything about how to address the problem better. I think that's what he's saying. No, fine. Then, then let's say you, I mean, if I take this way, I want to get inspiration from cognition, cognitive science, psychology, physiology, whatever it is, I want to incorporate into machine, right? So if I need to do that, I need to know how machine work better, right? So this is the technique available today, and this is the limitation. I take the inspiration, I will change this model this way, so that it will be better. So if I don't, I yeah. Hmm. Hmm. The same cohort, you know, basically have done that. Mm. Uh, so, in, in some sense, while nobody, or no, no one should argue that we should learn you know, what is happening today in this field, and then I think we have other discussions on that. Mm. So, we should ask about that. Mm. And here, mm. uh, uh, you know, the vision that's quoted from a low level data to outcome, that is not what current systems are doing. Mm -hmm. that, that they, they are not claiming to do that either. Mm -hmm. So we need to uh, still, so you know, broader context and understanding what current system does and what it could be doing mm -hmm. is also very important. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let me remind you, as I say this all the time, because mm -hmm. I believe it, <laughs> um, Mars. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Levels of analysis perspective is really important. Mm. You are talking about what's going on at the algorithmic level and critiquing the algorithm. And some of the discussion that we've had is at the higher level. What is it computing? Mm. Sort of analogous to Kaushik's point here that the thing that's in common 
at the algorithmic level mm -hmm. is this higher level thing called pressure differentials or whatever the aerodynamic function is. And some of us are working in a complementary way at that level. What is the system trying to compute? And then you go and impose that on the algorithm, but it's really hard to look at the algorithmic level mm. and identify what is missing. You got to look at the computational level and the purpose of the system to identify those deficiencies. At least from a cog at least that's what a cognitive scientist I would say. Both of you are saying the same thing. Yeah, you will go to that. So, for example, when you are trying to add knowledge to the self-attention framework. Uh, Add knowledge to the self attention framework. We sort of understood the nitty gritties of the self attention framework and then saw that maybe it can be interpreted as a fully connected graph and therefore we can do certain things to it. I think that's what he's trying to say. You do need to understand the nitty gritties of it to draw that common connection. Yeah, well, I, I certainly think you can't improve the algorithm without understanding how the algorithm works. But the question is where does the inspiration come from for improving the algorithm? Where do you identify the gaps? That's the paper is actually discussing about FCD, that you have to be dig into the concepts of uh, perception and cognition, and then you have to come with, come up with these challenges, like and then, uh, then yeah. take a top down. Yeah. Thing to do with it. You guys have to go to class. Yeah. Bye. Six, <laughs> already gone. Good job. <laughs> Yeah, so oh. doctors, I had this one question. Uh, if we look at it, it shows some form of abstraction. So how do we defend our stand now uh, when we say that these models cannot abstract? I can't read it. Can you make it any bigger? Mm. Oh, good. My, better. Oh, well, sort of better. Getting better. No, <laughs> that won't work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Your control response ratio really sucks on the computer. Okay. Okay, now what's the question? <laughs> what's the question, Vishal? Uh, so I can just show you. So this is the question that I asked. It. 140 by 80. An right. actionable insight. Okay. It seems pretty, pretty reasonable to me. Uh, so, so it's very nice. Okay. Now let me ask the supervisor. Does it uh, recognize that there's hypothyroidism? No. And this is why Dr. Sinod uses yeah. the dangerous use of cell GPT for these health problems. I just shared the um, uh, uh, you know, article like we're going to try another people where they uh, give check to be disposed to uh, doctors and then they evaluate it very methodically. Okay? So, and um, you know, the results uh, look very interesting. Um, uh, there's a lot of interesting things to learn, and we are we are not users. Uh, partly, uh, a simple thing that the fact that um, the uh, knowledge representation. Uh, anybody who worked in this field would have modeled the uh, uh, elevated, uh, sorry, the blood pressure, the, the hypertension, and hypothyroidism, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and that uh, they are both related to elevated blood pressure. Here, you went to elevated blood pressure, uh, related to hypertension, and made the thing, which is wrong, right? And it could lead to a you know very wrong uh, result. I have a I have an example. The point is that. Um, Maybe it is as simple as uh, making it this more informed right. that this should consult the knowledge graph that says anywhere at about elevated blood pressure, there are let us let me look up and say that multiple causes. Let me look at both the branches and then uh, you know say we should uh, be missing uh, 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 we will have test uh, to give me further data whether uh, you ruled out hypothesis or not. Or do the test for the third test and then tell me what you have done or not. Something along that line. Okay. I have an example from that's in the published literature, and you have an example from parole. <laughs> but my example in the published literature is that because of the context of elevated blood pressure, 
a, a resident came in, asked an attending, you know, I've got elevated blood pressure, I want to give this, that, and the other drug. And the attending physician said, that's all well and good. Did you ask whether or not the patient has been using cocaine? Because if you use that drug in combination with cocaine, you're going to kill them. <laughs> and in, in Parul's situation, there was a constraint about how to lower the blood pressure because of the nature of the, of the, of the problem. So there's just a much bigger picture that comes to bear on answering yeah, yeah. So, questions. So she had elevated blood pressure, yeah. talking about 212 over yeah. <laughs> something, okay? <laughs> and they did not give her medication for one whole day. Yeah. And they had damn good reasons for that, saying, I need to rule this out before I do yeah. that. <laughs> and they said that if I, uh, also, I have to reduce the pressure in a very uh, deliberate manner, manner uh, not, you know, uh, suddenly, yeah. Suddenly. And the class of medication to be picked uh, it depends on some other things that will be happening. Yeah. So they did MRI and other things, and they ruled out several things before uh, they went to the yeah. So things are far more complicated than and that. <laughs> the minimum thing I can say is that um, there will be a better system if you take this and at least combine appropriately with the knowledge, right? If you have settled knowledge. And have, you have uh, the medical knowledge graph or technology, and you have a uh, uh, practice guideline. And you say, okay, here's a practice guideline. I'm to practice guide will say, check this, check this, do this out, then do this, right? And I have practice guideline of uh, reducing the blood pressure because of one uh, path versus another path. And you, you need to follow both the paths until you one is ruled out, and then you go uh, to that. Um, there are other things, uh, you know, there are, she has uh, uh, a version of GBS. So, you know, uh, disease. And they started, in that case, her on medication also, out of uh, water. Uh, thinking negative, but... Uh, would be worse than yeah. standard therapy. So that is what complexity uh, is something that is in the, so it's a simple uh, uh, for what 